by Widespread Request, your guide to using input shaping in Marlin firmware. We'll get your printer moving faster than ever without losing any quality. Input shaping is one of the best things to happen to 3D printing in some time. And now Marlin, the most utilized 3D printing firmware by some margin, supports it too. In this video, we're gonna go step by step in getting it set up, calibrated, and tested. I think that we should start with the question, what is input shaping? A technical explanation is that it's a control technique for reducing vibrations on our 3D printer. But what you really need to know is that it's a way to print fast, but without the usual reduction in print quality. As we up speeds and especially acceleration, 3D printing becomes a lot more violent. The vibration of the mechanical parts can be seen as an artifact on the surface of the 3D print known as ringing or ghosting. Some printers suffer from bad ghosting even at low speeds because they've got a particularly heavy print head to move around. But in any case, we should notice that the oscillations seen on the surface repeat at a regular interval and this is related to the resonant frequency of the machine. Resonant frequencies, when used correctly, can be a powerful tool, such as a musical instrument, where resonant frequencies are exploited to play specific notes. If we can find a way to measure the resonant frequency of our 3D printer, the firmware can alter the output of the stepper motor to cancel out the ringing, just like a bird on a windy branch can cancel out those vibrations, keeping its head still to track prey. Input shaping, also known as resonance compensation, has been in Clipper firmware for some time now. It's also supported in RepRap firmware, however a point of discussion is that you need to have the same value for X and Y. And when Bamboo Lab released the X1 Carbon and the P1P, they have their own version as well, which they call Active Vibration Compensation. So it is exciting that now Marlin has introduced input shaping as a version 212. The first step in getting ready is to upgrade to the latest version of Marlin firmware and then print some baseline tests. If you're like me, you're still running Marlin 2.0, so the first thing you need to do is migrate to Marlin 2.1. If this is the first time that you're editing Marlin firmware, I have a video linked below that shows you all of the software setup you need to do so. Just make sure when you're downloading the code from Marlin's GitHub that you set the branch to either 2.1x or what I'm using in this video, bugfix 2.1.x. After that, you can download a zip as shown in the video. If you already have experience at editing Marlin firmware and you're simply looking for a way to migrate to the latest version efficiently, I have another previous video linked below that should prove quite helpful. One method it showcases is comparing two separate files where the differences in the files will be highlighted so you can bring any of the changes you've made to suit your particular printer over to the newest version. Another option it shows is how to use GitHub Desktop to keep track of your firmware and merge the latest changes upstream from GitHub into the firmware files you've already customized, resolving conflicts along the way. When making this video, I wanted to compare the old and new versions of Marlin to see the differences in structure, so I went for the most primitive technique possible, scrolling through the two files side by side and copying over any changes I've made to suit this printer. There's one technique that I finally adopted from my patron Patrick, and that's to add a comment with my initials after any individual lines that I've altered. And that is gonna make life easy in the future, because now I can search for that comment and very quickly loop through my code finding any customizations I've ever made. Once all of the changes have been ported over, you can compile your firmware, but I would recommend before flashing it to connect via terminal and send M503, which will output all of your saved values in the EEPROM. You can then copy all of these to a text file for later reference. And that's because when updating to a much newer version of the firmware, you're likely to get an EEPROM initialization error. And when you reset the EEPROM, you're going to lose those precious settings. But because you have them saved, you can copy and paste any lines that are relevant back into the terminal to reapply those settings, saving you time from retuning things like your probe Z offset. You should of course check that the printer's readout for the firmware version matches what you've just flashed, but there's some other checks you should do as well. These include basics such as auto homing the printer, because as you can see here, for some reason my X, Y and Z axes were reversed and I had to recompile the firmware to fix it. I also found that the linear advanced values I was running previously didn't seem to translate over to this newest version of the firmware. To avoid mishaps, I turned it off for the rest of the tests. 
In summary, complete a few test prints just to make sure that everything is working properly before you proceed with enabling input shaping. The next prints are optional before tests, but I would highly recommend them as we want a reliable indicator to know if input shaping is doing its job. The first is the speed and max flow test from my calibration website, as I wanted to see how much faster I could print without running out of hot end flow. I started with my normal speed of 100 millimeters per second and got it to increase by 10 millimeters per second for every segment. When used like this, the print doesn't need to be pretty. We're just making sure that we have consistent extrusion without any gaps to know that the hot end can keep up, which it could. So I put those feed rates into the acceleration test page and then set up an acceleration increase from the standard 500 up to 1000 for the top band. When you print this or any of the other test prints in this video, I'd recommend using a very glossy or silk filament so any ringing is as obvious as possible. And here's our baseline pre-input shaping. The y-axis ringing steadily increases as the acceleration goes up. The x-axis is a lot more subtle. But if I rotate the model to one of the other corners, the X ringing does increase in a subtle way as the acceleration picks up. With our prep work complete, let's proceed with our aim of seeing if we can eliminate ringing. Our first step being to modify the firmware. To make these changes, we head to configuration underscore ADV and do control F for search and type in shaping. This will take us to the correct section we need to edit. Our primary changes are to uncomment the lines input shaping X and input shaping Y. These two lines basically turn on input shaping. Since we haven't run any calibration tests yet, we don't know the values to put in this section so we should just ignore it for now. Optionally, we can uncomment shaping menu and as the name implies, in the configuration section of our printer, we'll be able to see and edit the values for input shaping. Our last optional parameters won't apply to most people. If when you compile firmware, the RAM usage is too high for your liking, you can uncomment these two lines and play with the values. I uncommented these lines and did just that to see how the values affected RAM usage. If you are in a pinch for RAM, pause the video and follow the guide on screen. That's everything we need to change in the firmware so we can compile ready to flash it to the main board. If you didn't earlier, take this chance to send M503 over terminal and save the output once again, we don't want to lose any of our EEPROM settings, as flushing the update will once again give us an EEPROM error. You can test if the update worked by looking for that input shaping menu, assuming that you enabled it in the firmware. Alternatively, you can connect via terminal and send M593, which should return the default input shaping values. We're all set, so let's calibrate input shaping for our printer. For other firmwares, we generally have two methods for calibrating input shaping and finding out the resonant frequencies. We can print a ringing test and measure the distance between the oscillations, or we can tune automatically using an accelerometer. Marlin doesn't support accelerometers, so therefore we're going to have to do a print test. And all of the instructions for this are on the M593 input shaping G-code reference. The first thing we need to do is download the ringing tower STL, and this looks to be the same model as Clipper uses. The X and Y sides are in the right position, so don't rotate it, unless you're using a Core XY 3D printer, in which case you rotate the model 45 degrees, which should end up looking something like this. This model needs to be printed in VARS mode, and your slicer should turn off top solid layers and set the infill to zero when you enable this. It's also important to slice with a layer height of 0.2 millimeters. For our speed, we want it to be quite high, as the aim is to induce ringing. You also want your acceleration set high enough to induce ringing as well. The real key is this script that we're going to insert to occur on each layer change. If you're using Prusa Slicer or Super Slicer, we can copy this second one and paste it in the after layer G code section. As discussed in this video, Cura unfortunately doesn't support conditional G code. So in that case, you can use the free browser based slicer called Kirimoto, copy the first script and paste it into the G code macros for layer change. If you have to use a different slicer to normal just for this test, that's fine because it's not about print quality. It's about the M593 G code commands that are gonna be inserted throughout the print. The first command will turn input shaping off and then each M593 after that will turn it back on and change the frequency at which it's applied. The default range starting at 15 Hertz and topping out at 60 by the end of the print. Now comes the easiest part. We just need to print the G code. As the print progresses, visually there'll be no change, 
but the input shaping frequency will be constantly changing. When the print completes, we'll be examining X as well as Y, and what we're looking for is a sweet spot for each in terms of surface quality and rigging. The first thing to look for is this gap, and we want to pick a height where it doesn't close up. Apart from that, we're just looking for the height with the least amount of ringing, and I would recommend drawing a horizontal line there. You'll notice that near the bottom where the frequency is low, my print quality is much worse. This is highlighted by the glossy filament, and hopefully you too will be able to see an obvious sweet spot where you think the quality is best, and once again you can mark it with a pen. Now to measure the height. You can use a ruler, or in my case digital calipers, to line up the mark with the bottom of the model. Here my X is 19mm and my Y axis is a little bit lower at 16.3mm. If you use the standard formula, which means you tested from 15 up to 60Hz over the height of the print, we're given a formula to determine the value we need. However, Tim from TH3D has created an excellent page that does the maths for us. All we need to do is enter the heights we measured for both the X and Y axis. In my case, 16 and 19 millimeters. The formula will be applied instantly to tell us our frequency, but we'll also be given the G-code command we need to enter to store these settings. If you're really bad at maths, or perhaps you've changed the default numbers from the formula, we can come to the G-code that we printed, look for the section at the height that we measured, and then we'll see the frequency that we're after. Once we have our frequencies for X and Y, we have two ways to store them. If you enable the LCD menu, you can set your values for X and Y here, and don't forget to store your settings to EEPROM after doing this. Alternatively, we can enter M593 via terminal, referring to the examples on the page. Here I'm setting the X frequency with the M593X and then F2705, followed by setting the Y frequency, setting it to 29.09. And again, remember to store these settings to EEPROM by sending M500. Time for some follow-up test prints to see how well it works. With the input shaping parameters set, it was time to reprint our earlier G-code from before we made any changes. The X-axis on this 3D printer didn't really have any ringing beforehand, so the after result looks quite similar. The Y-axis, however, I think has a clear improvement in the ringing to the right-hand side of the Y, thanks to input shaping. I wanted to push things further, so I upped the acceleration values in the firmware and printed another set of before and after tests. This time, I got noticeably more ringing for the x-axis, which is noticeably improved with input shaping. The y-axis, just like before, isn't perfect, but it's definitely cleaner for the after print with input shaping in place. So how about a practical print to show the real-life benefits of input shaping? This corner clamp remixed by Redcoat. I printed multiple versions of this for comparison. One with input shaping turned off using my old speeds in acceleration, and another with higher speed in acceleration using input shaping to maintain quality. Despite the significant change in print settings, I think you'll agree that these two prints look more or less identical. I don't think there's been any loss of quality from pushing the higher pace. And here's where that really counts. The baseline print took over four hours, and the bottom one with input shaping just under three, a time saving of 30%. You might be wondering how the print would look if I ran these speeds and accelerations with input shaping turned off. Well, I did try, and this is the result. A failed print from layer shifting. You have to remember the input shaping is a smoothing algorithm, and therefore has this additional benefit. I experienced y-axis layer shifts multiple times in preparing this video, none of which, however, were after input shaping was enabled. Good stuff, and to finish off, a few tidbits to try and future-proof this video. There's two parameters for M593 that I haven't covered so far. The first is D or damping factor. Consider this the strength at which the input shaping is applied, with the default value being 0.15. And you can experiment with this number if there's still too much ringing, but be careful not to oversmooth and lose detail. The other is listed in the firmware and will be implemented in the future, and that's the shaping algorithm being used. Once the T parameter is in place, you'll be able to experiment with these different algorithms to see if one works better than the others for you. Unlike some other settings on your 3D printer, input shaping may need retuning from time to time. So when exactly do we need to re-measure frequencies and recalibrate? Firstly, if there's any change in frame rigidity or change in belt tension, either of those are going to affect how the printer vibrates and therefore you'll need to retune. Secondly, any change in moving mass. For instance, changing your part cooling system, your ABL probe, or even just your hot end. 
or for a bed slinger, changing your bed material, such as adding or removing a glass plate, or even adding insulation to the underside. Basically anything that will change the moving mass. Finally, some of these things will change with general usage over time, particularly belt tension. So if you notice your quality is starting to suffer, consider retuning. My last point is that input shaping is taxing for the mainboard, and I did notice that the LCD menu became sluggish. This particular Ender 3 has an SKR E3 Turbo controlled by Octoprint. The only loss of performance I noticed was in these LCD menus, but it's worth noting that less powerful boards might suffer more. Finally, it's worth noting that at the time of recording, Marlin's input shaping is still considered experimental, although I had no problems with it. As I said at the start, input shaping is one of the best things to happen to 3D printing in some time. And now that Marlin firmware supports it, more people can enjoy it than ever before. Let me know in the comments section if you're going to try this or perhaps if you already have. Thank you to all of the Marlin team for getting this implemented. Thank you for watching the whole way to the end. And until next time, happy artifact free, high speed 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.